Well, hello, friends. Before we start today's episode, I want to remind you of the current special we are running for our next How to Charge live event in September of 2023 at our offices just south of Nashville, Tennessee. If you're coming into town, you'll need a place to stay. So we're offering $500 off your registration to put towards your hotel stay. That'll cover your entire stay at the local hotels that we recommend you stay at while you're in town. So to get that discount, you simply enter free hotel, no spaces, free hotel, into the coupon code box on the checkout page. So go to howtochargelive.com to sign up for the event and learn how to add six figures of planning revenue to your business in the next year. We guarantee that the event will pay for itself and your first planning client. So if you still have questions, you can also book an appointment to talk with me directly at howtochargelive.com. So we'll see you soon. Now on to today's episode. Today's guest is Bill Williams, who's the Executive Vice President of the Ameriprise Independent Advisors. Bill represents over 8,200 independent financial advisors who generate over $5 billion in annual revenue for the firm. So Bill leads the practice management, independent advisor recruiting, the National Sales Organization, leadership development, field operations, and practice technology implementation to support the growth of the overall business. He joined Ameriprise in 1989 as a financial advisor, and you'll hear more about his story in today's episode. And also, I want to point out his story about how he goes into leadership. It's pretty interesting, and I won't give away the whole story, but it's a reminder to listen to your parents, even if you're not a kid anymore. Bill also shares some fascinating stats that Ameriprise has compiled from the clients that they serve on how the impact of financial planning for your business cannot be ignored. To put it simply, if you want more engaged clients to handle more assets, to sell more insurance, and to get three times better client retention, then you have to do paid financial planning. So here's Sten's conversation with Bill Williams. All right, Bill, welcome to the Becoming Elite Advisor podcast. Um, I'll say it because you won't, but Bill's kind of a big deal. Uh, so I'm uh, thankful you're here. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I don't know if I'm a big deal or not, but I appreciate the invite. <laughs> you bet. Uh, well, I'd love if you'd kind of real quick, um, I've been able to kind of hear your background and stuff, but if you'd kind of, for our listeners, wide range listeners from new advisors to advisors that have been in business for a long time, uh, we even have advisors that are in college programs that listen and, and kind of track and use our content to make kind of d- decisions for their career. So if you give kind of your background, your progression, uh, which will lead well into you know why we have you on and we can dive into some topics. Sure. I started in the career right out of college as a financial advisor back in 1989, graduated with a finance and economics degree. I actually took elective courses in college from an RIA that came on campus and taught us how to do uh, financial plans using Excel spreadsheets. And then we had to present in front of the class what our recommendations were for, for various clients that he brought in. And wow. I, I started originally with a company called IDS Financial Services that then became American Express Financial Advisors. And now it's called Ameriprise. I was an advisor for about a decade. During that time, I got into leadership and did some training. And then I sold my practice uh, in the mid-90s and then moved full-time into leadership, spent some time in California running one of the Silicon Valley offices. And I ran uh, Florida offices for a while. Then I moved up to the Twin Cities and ran a territory around the Midwest. And then I moved into executive leadership. Uh, today, I'm on the executive leadership team of the global firm Ameriprise. And then I lead the um, about 8,200 independent advisors uh, at the firm. Nice. Well, let's say uh, it's definitely a mission to be in leadership. They kept talking you into it because I know that's a hard, uh, hard role in our business. <laughs> it's the hardest decision I ever made in my career. I mean, I had a lot of flexibility in my time. I was a top 1% advisor out of 6,000. I was making more money in my early 20s than I ever thought I would. And, and so they, they kept coming back at me. You know, would you just teach this class? Yeah. Would you just cover this appointment? Yeah. Would you just work on this case? And the next thing I know, I, you know, I talked into, into becoming a full-time leader. And I actually called my dad and I said, uh, I'm really worried about making this move. And he said, if you had to go back into practice, do you think you could build it faster and better the second time? And I said, I said, yeah, I think, I think I probably could. And he said, will you ever get another shot at leadership if you turn them down? And I said, maybe, but probably not. Cause 
I'll reject an offer. And he goes, what do you got to lose? Go, go build the skills as a leader. And if you go back to being an advisor, at least you know how to lead your team. So I thought it was, I thought it was good advice and it worked out okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And what I love and, and why I wanted to have you on, I'm glad it worked out, is Ameriprise, if you ask about financial planning, Ameriprise has been in that conversation for a long time. Now with EAN and the speaking uh-huh. engagements we do and the coaching we do, the, the wave is is gaining steam as this has to be a, a foundational piece of a practice. It's healthy. Um, more and more people are saying it's the right way to do the business. Or is your experience going through the industry? You've seen changes from, hey, it's all about stocks. It's all about selling mutual funds to very product driven. What has been your experience? And then what are you even feeling or sensing now on why more advisors are open to saying, hey, my time is valuable. And while products are great and are needed, they're open to exploring this other way, maybe more now than they have in the past. Yeah, I, it's a good point, uh, Stan. And I have to sort of go back and full and fair disclosure, when I started as a brand new advisor, my leader at the time, a, a guy named Larry Post back in the day, he was really progressive. And he said, you can't bring on a client who's not a comprehensive planning client that you char- don't charge a fee to. You have to bring them on through comprehensive planning. I didn't know any different. So, what year was that? Yeah, that was, I started getting licensed in 88, and then I actually got appointed in 89. And I made about a thousand dials a week. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I, there was literally a thousand was my goal. I set somewhere around 15 appointments when I saw two to three of those appointments live. Um, and, but every client I brought on a hundred clients in my first year and all of them did comprehensive planning with me. And so it's sort of ingrained in my DNA from day one. Yep. But even today in leading the platform, we've got some advisors that engage in, in planning and some that do more asset management. You think out of, you know, the whole firm has 10,000 plus advisors. Yep. One of the things we did recently is we took a look at those practices that did uh, more planning and they had a higher degree of contact with clients. They had a broader spectrum of investment selection, generally driven off of the planning. And they used digital more with their clients. And we Wanted to break it down into the ones who are high users of those four things and then those that were sort of low users, just to see where there are real big differences. And there was about a three times difference in net flows annually for somebody who incorporated planning. Wow. Uh, the retention of clients was 300% better uh, than somebody who just did investment management. Uh, the overall net flows that came into the practice were significantly greater. So it's like the Every metric we looked at was literally three times greater versus the um, investment only choice. Yep. And so then we went and we wanted to ask clients about this. And so we surveyed a bunch of what we call target market clients, which is a fancy term for people who have money that you know, are in what we call the responsible mindset. Yep. And we basically asked them a bunch of questions. What, what is it you want from a financial advisor? or from a firm. And they said, one is I want uh, somebody I can trust. So, you know, really obvious, right? And then they said, I want to meet face-to-face. I want somebody who goes beyond investment management. And I want somebody that sees my whole picture. And that came out in every survey that we did over and over with somebody who sort of won that end-to-end. And we followed it up with a question where we said, you know, that, that's hard to come by. Are you willing to pay for it? Nice. Okay. And we asked that question, and we've asked that question about every two years since 2008. In 2008, the target market, about 30% of them said I'd be willing to pay for it. This was right before the recession. Hmm. Fast forward to today, that same target market, 60% of them are willing to pay a, for, for a fee for a financial advisor above and beyond investment management. Wow. Well, the, there's, they know they're going to pay for investment management no matter where they go, yep. but getting that holistic, comprehensive planner to sit down and spend a little bit more time holistically, now 60% of the target market unaided with a single question, say, I'm willing to write you a check stand for what you bring to bear in my situation. What that tells me is we should at least be offering it. Now, not everybody's going to accept it, but I think what we've got to do is say, this is how we operate and here are your choices on how you do business for me. I think clients need to also know what's going to give them the best chance of achieving their goals. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I come to you, I say, listen, I want to make 
a really good return on my money and I want to reach my goals and I want to have a million dollars when I retire and feel comfortable. I'm asking you, what, what's the number one thing I can do? And I can tell you from all the research, number one thing you can do is take a step back and do a financial plan with me and meet with me a couple of times a year and stay on, on track and not make emotional right. decisions. I mean, we all know that because we're in the business, but clients don't know that. They think they you're going to pick the hot stock, right? So anyway, yeah. sorry, I, I just rambled because I got so excited no. about the, uh, the top. I love it. Yeah, what I'm hearing is that it's what you knew, but the data reinforces it now that it's only gaining momentum the the mark the target market is essentially seeing the value in it more and more so what would you say or what do you say to advisors because it sounds like even within your large group there's full believers people are like this is the only way to do the business and there's those that are saying sure it'd probably work but i'm comfortable over here what what do you say to those advisors that are like product is is working just well enough for me so why would i change it you know, that, that is, you, you framed it perfectly. Um, and, and unfortunately, most advisors, and you know this, are largely paid when you look at their revenue stream off of asset management. And, mm-hmm. I, and somebody asked me the other day, why do I think that is? And I think it's just, it's just easier to say to a client, I, I only charge 1% to manage all your money versus I charge $2,000 a year to be your financial advisor. The 2000 sounds large, the 1% sounds low. Even if they do the math, though, you know, it might it might calculate differently. So I think advisors take an easy road in, in the conversation. Yep. But I also think clients are used to that kind of concept of a small percentage of a big number versus paying a fixed fee. Mm-hmm. The best advisors have the confidence to separate those two things out, where they go, listen, I can manage your money with the help of my broader team and the support of my firm. And mm-hmm. I've got experts that are institutional money managers that partner with me. And there is a fee to do that. That's similar to what you're going to pay no matter what. But because I'm going to meet with you multiple times a year, we're going to update your financial plan. I'm going to look at your estate plan. I'm going to make sure your beneficiaries are, are right. I'm going to look at your benefits at work. We're going to calculate out how much you're going to need for each of your goals. We're going to make sure that you're well protected. And we've done all the things necessary each year to keep you on track. And I'll be here if you ever have a question on anything having to do with money, I'm your personal advisor. Just call me. I'm on retainer with you basically by you doing financial planning. When someone explains it that way, they go, oh, I'll sign up for that. That's right. But, but you have to have the confidence to sort of lay that out. And there's money management, and then there's comprehensive planning. Yes, comprehensive planning is manage money, but the two are different services. And you're not going to get it at a lot of the do-it-yourself places. And you've got to be bold enough to say that. I agree. Yeah. And we've coached thousands of advisors by now. And what we hear is, I already do financial planning. And that's back to my early days of managing money. It was what we kind of sprinkled in between the strategy calls. But AUM was the focus. And I'd answer your questions if you had them, but there was no intentionality behind it. So I love the idea that like we have to be, we have to be confident in the fact that there are two separate offerings. And we have to believe that they both have value in and of themselves and be able to say, it maybe isn't either or. There's some advisors where we don't say, you don't have to charge a planning fee, but be willing to know that it's valuable and give them the option to say yes. Because what I see appearing in the market is the risk of if you don't offer it and somebody else does, what if your client hears about it from somebody else or meets with a different advisor and they're like, oh, my advisor doesn't offer that, is that we tell advisors on a lot of platforms like this is coming more and more advisors are realizing the value of it. And if your client doesn't hear about it from you, there's a good chance to hear about it from somebody else. I, I 100% agree. There's a risk that you know they're craving it. And if you don't deliver it, then they're going to go somewhere else. I, I just also think that if your value proposition is managing money, so often it comes down to, did you make me a return this year? Yeah. Versus are we planning for the bigger picture over the long term? And are you valuable in answering a broad spectrum of financial problem questions for me and helping me feel more secure holistically? I think it's only a matter of time before you know some of these do-it-yourself firms really figure out a very personal approach to asset management. Mm. And it's going to be a lower and lower price because it's a commodity over time. And so if what you banked on is investment management, it's a matter of time before the client goes, wait a second, I just heard that XYZ company does exactly the same thing for a third of the price. Why don't they go over there? What they're not going to find though, oh my God, they meet with me four times a year. They know my whole family. They know my all my goals. They do a financial plan for me. They look at all of my holdings. 
They look at, you know, alternative investments. They look at how my insurances come together. They look at my beneficiaries. They look at all my benefits. They see how it all comes together and they hold my hand through the downturn. That's not going to happen at the other firms. Yeah. And, and, but it has to be something you deliberately talk about and deliver. Yeah, I agree. The, the progression I've seen is we'll run into advisors that have never done it before. And so the fact that they ask for a fee for the first time is a win because that's just breaking down their, their mindset. Yes. And then there's a point of where you just start asking for the fee to people you've been working with before. You, you're, you've probably already been serving them to some capacity above AUM. So it's maybe not totally changing your business. But then you hit a point that on your own, it, it kind of requires a team and a business model for it to scale. With the advisors within your business, what's what are you seeing the most successful ones their practices look like? My guess is it's not one advisor and one assistant. What does that evolve into? Yeah, you're you're hitting on something very important. Although at our firm, one of the things we try to do is say, listen, you tell me what type of model you want to run. If you want to run a solo or simplified stream down approach, that's fine. To mm-hmm. get to comprehensive planning, we've got remote services to gather the data, do the financial plan, update the service meeting, and hand it to you electronically. So you will basically a virtual back office that you can hire. And right. so that you look like a bigger team if you want to keep it simple. But it's still a team. And so, and then there's the, the bigger teams, the conglomerates will create centralized services. And so the advisor, the relationship leader will say, Hey, Stan, I think we should do comprehensive planning. You go, yeah, that sounds great to me. And then somebody calls and gathers your information. Somebody else does the financial plan update. You then get all of that plus some basic recommendations to refine that. You then create your proposal for the client, you meet with the client, and then you say, so-and-so will come in next and implement it with all the paperwork and information online to gather and get the accounts fulfilled. That's, that's the team approach, right? When you have somebody you can delegate to, or I liken it to going to the doctor. I just, just switched doctors and I went in for my first full physical a couple of weeks ago. The person checking me in helped me fill out my online forms. I then went back and somebody else did my blood pressure and my height, my weight, and they took my blood and all that, that stuff. Somebody else then did get the analytics down down the hall. Then the doctor came up, we read the analytics, and somebody else sort of got the rest of the stuff going after the doctor left. The doctor operates in a team. Why shouldn't a financial doctor operate the same way? Teams create scale, and sometimes you can outsource that. But in order to create the end-to-end on this, I've seen advisors start to charge fees, do comprehensive planning, and then they stop doing it because they run out of bandwidth themselves. Yeah. And so one of the critical pieces is who's helping you get all this stuff done. That's one of the first questions you have to answer, which I think is your point. Yep. No, I love that. Cause it is, it is harder as I've talked to advisors in their mind. It's that, that sounds like more, it sounds harder. And I guess as an advisor, the, if you're listening, you have to decide is my goal to make good money, the easiest way possible without doing anything hard and taking an easy path. Or as a business owner is my goal to make as much impact as possible to lead people uh-huh. And those are two different choices. And I think so. So my goal at times, like I don't want to talk an advisor that's looking for the easy path into doing something hard because they may just back out. It's like, are you committed to saying, I believe this is the right way. The good news is I make more revenue because I get paid for my time. And Bill, what you're saying is you get more AUM. And, and if you're in more of an insurance environment and you're listening, you probably get more insurance too. It's just being willing to say, I'm going to step into something new and a little uncertain because with the data and what I'm hearing and a lot of our training is it is a better way if you can adopt it. Yeah. Short-term discomfort for really long-term benefit that, that keeps paying itself back year after year after year. That, but that, that change that first year, I'm not going to discount it. If you haven't done this before, it is a change. It is hard to kind of get yourself motivated to sit in front of that client that you've given her, feel like you've given it away for free and then go, I'm going to try something new with you. I can do comprehensive planning now. And here's what it looks like. And do you want to pay me? You know, that's scary. Um, but if you can get past that with your first few clients, it's a much easier way to operate. And then the pressure is off you on, I have to perform every single year to get this account. Yep. And we, we teach you about it. It is weird when you say, I've given away something on Friday and then on Monday, I'm all of a sudden going to charge for it is that we teach advisors, like you need to actually present that it's something different. You're not going to go to them yes. and say, hey, you're just going to start paying me for the same stuff. Right. And you may, I do it all still, we're, the, formulate it in such a way to where you are making it a new offering. Um, and that's that's an initial hurdle we see advisors getting stuck on. Um, 
Can I comment Robin, on that real quick? Can I, yeah, can I just, maybe that's where you roll your question, but one of the things we teach our advisors is this thing called a menu of services. And it's, it's, you know, you go pretty much anywhere these days and then they're trying to get you to sign up for what it, you know, you even go to a massage therapist or you go to, even the doctor right. I just visited said, you know, do you want just, you know, pay for each visit or do you want to sign up for a concierge service? The same is true with financial planning, right? I can work with you. And some people say I'll work with you on an investment only basis. Some people say I'll work with you on a basic planning basis. But you have to start somewhere. What's the, what's the lowest? And then what's the most complex? And then is there something in between? I like three options, possibly four. And right. you describe in the boxes on a piece of paper that you present to the client to look at, you know, complexity would sort of play into this based on how much wealth you need me to help manage and how big your estate is and how complex and how mm-hmm. deep we have to go to solve some of your financial needs, put you in this particular box and you know, or do you want just investment only? Do you want basic financial planning to get started? Or do you want this? And which one fits? The client will gravitate to what they need. And almost always they'll pick the more comprehensive one. Yep. Yeah. You, you can definitely lay out the price. Kind of your, your communicator marketing hat on to say, how do I convey this in a way yes. that clearly understand the value? Um, and I love that thought because when I first started doing financial plans, I offered one option and I was really giving them a yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to saying, hey, I'm going to give you multiple things based on what you need, and I'm going to lean into one that I think is the best for you. Uh, but what I appreciate is when I was early in my career, only doing investments, had a high minimum for somebody in their 20s just because of the firm I was working with. I was in a meeting and I'd quickly try to get to the assets column. And if I figured out you didn't have money for me to manage, I checked out because I couldn't serve you. And so as I progress now, I don't turn clients away. I say either if you have AUM, great, we can talk about that. But also you can pay me for my time. It really is now the client telling you, no, thanks. I don't have to turn people away or say you don't have enough money because if people are willing to pay for the value, I have that option as well. I think that's so smart. you know. And then and then they know, like, let's say they say no today because I used to have the same situation happen where people say, no, I don't know if we've got enough money to make this work and I'm not sure I can afford to pay for this. I got calls several years later. Hey, we're, we've now got the money. I thought about you, Bill. I'd like to. I'd like to become your client again, and we've got some money we can invest and do comprehensive planning with you. It's like you've laid it out for them in a menu, and it's clear. Would you? And you have a unique seat and picture. Um, as you look at the landscape of the industry, is this still an, an opportunity, a blue ocean, when it comes to being able to charge for your advice and communicate that clearly as a revenue stream? Or do you say of the advisors you have influence over that most of them have already adopted it? And I know Ameriprise is a little different, but if you look at the industry. Well, it's, you know, Ameriprise has sort of been a leader in this. We've never deviated. Some firms have kind of tried to get people to do financial planning, and then they back off. Or they incentivize financial planning, and then they back off. So when we, for 40, 50 years, we have, haven't, haven't lost our focus on this. And as I said before, it doesn't mean that some advisors don't fully embrace it. Out of 10,000, you're going to have a mixture. The majority really do some form of, of planning. I still think even at Ameriprise, there's blue ocean here. Uh, the, the data says the client wants a deeper or frequent conversation. They want to start all service meetings with a goal or view, see where they stand, and then they want to know how they're doing on their investments against their specific goals. And I think we you can't take it deep enough. One of the things that we created is this artificial intelligence review for all of our clients, because we have so much data from the financial plans, we're pulling that information into an AI engine and then we're feeding it back to our advisors saying, here's the 20 ideas you could bring to your client that would help them get closer to their goals. It could be something as simple as um, you're missing a beneficiary on these IRA accounts. Nice. Or uh, we notice you've got an in-service distribution opportunity on the 401k at the company they're at because they just turned 55. Mm. Or um, we looked and they have no life insurance at all, and yet they just had a child, You and we saw that in the system. Oh, that's um, great. Make sure they're covered. And so we're trying to feed our advisors these ideas that it could be brought up in the next meeting. Those kinds of ideas are planning ideas. That's, right. that's part of comprehensive planning. And so it's a lead into it. I love that. So as we kind of wrap up here, if you had an advisor, and I'm sure you have this conversation with an Ameriprise, 
and they are they're kind of in the industry, have some experience, but they're frustrated because they're like, I'm not getting assets fast enough. And I, with the stats of I don't know, 90% of advisors not making it past five years, like this is still true. And they're stuck and they're the current model is not working. What do you say to advisors about here's how you here's how you break out of that and go to the next level? Is it boost your confidence and learn how to charge for your advice? What what would you say to them? I'd say focus as much as you can on the clients you do have. If you can go in and spend more time, even if you feel like you're giving away something for free, mm-hmm. um, go in and take whatever client you've got or any prospect you've got and spend a ton of time looking at all the pieces. Ask them to look at their benefits, look at their insurances and see if there's an opportunity to do something different with their homeowners or, or their auto coverage. Um, look at ways that they could save more money through a budgeting tool. I, Whenever it takes to have them feel like you are turning over every rock on their behalf and you totally care about them because you do, when you fully invest yourself in your client situation and you're not looking just at the AUM or what you're making on that client, they sense it. Suddenly, they start to refer you to their parents who have money, uh, their friend who just inherited something. They, They go, you know, Sten really cares about me. He's the type of person I can trust. And you should be working with Stan Duke because I can tell I've got no money and I, he's not making much money, but he's spending a lot of time with me. So if you have somebody who's stuck, I say double down on the client experience. More advice, greater contact, broaden the advice set, and you can't lose on that. That's great. Yeah. And then what I hear you saying is start building out essentially your planning service model live now, even if you don't have the confidence to charge for it yet, build out that experience because the it's really a limiting belief to just all of a sudden turn it on and start asking for a fee. And what I know is I've worked with thousands of advisors that it's possible and there's a lot of opportunity. So if you're listening and you're like, Sten, those clients don't exist. There's no way they're going to pay me for that. We have countless examples of advisors doing it and getting paid and they have more clients than they can handle. So the opportunity is not the question. But what I've seen is just the advisor confidence. It's like, are yeah. you going to buy in and just see your exactly. time is valuable? And yep. if so, you need to go for it. You are so right. You're 100% right. It, it is right between our ears because there's thousands upon thousands of advisors doing it every single day and building a book based on true advice. You just got to decide that's your value proposition and that's your why. And you, you got to kind of mentally burn the boats on the beach and go, this is the way I'm going to operate. I'm going to professionalize my menu of services. I'm going to price myself comfortably where I want to be priced and I'm going to start. I'm just going to start. I'm going to find 10 clients at this conversation. And I'm not going to look back. And Beautiful. you once you get through this for six months and you commit to it, you will never look back. You'll never go back to just investment management. I promise you. That's a great way to end it. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for being here. You bet. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the chance. Have a great day. You too. Hey, this is Andy again. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I want to remind you that the coupon code to get that discount for our in-person event in September is free hotel, no spaces. So go to howtochargelive.com, howtochargelive.com to get your seat, or you can also book an appointment to get your questions answered, should you still have any. So on behalf of Sten and myself, thank you for being a faithful listener to the show. We appreciate your feedback on iTunes, or you can send me an email, andy at eadvisornetwork.com. Keep up the great work and keep charging for your advice. You're worth every penny and more.